I started at the University of the Orange Free State in 1948. And at that stage, uh, my intention was to study theology. But then as my major subjects, I selected psychology and also sociology. And of course, besides that, I did Greek and Hebrew as well, for which I'm very grateful today. And I always joke, I say, that uh, I know everything about Shakespeare, but I've only read it in Afrikaans. <laughs> when it comes to theology, if you can't read the original languages, you suck, you're stuck. Where did your career start? Following the University of Orange Free State, I had my first position in 1952 at the Department of Labour in East London. And there were, I was really a sort of a, what would you say, a, a counsellor for, for young, uh, young people starting work for the first time, mm. to give them counselling, to help them in the choice of their subjects, etc. Then from, from uh, the Department of Labour, I went to the old uh, National Bureau for Educational and Social Research, which later became the Human Sciences Research Council. And I worked for them for about two years. And one of my major assignments there was the, to, to help with the standardization of the new South African group intelligence test. And the net result was that I, I went all over the country to apply the test in schools. The test was very neatly developed. However, there wasn't a single set of norms for whites and blacks. We, we maintained separate norms for whites and separate norms for blacks. And whenever it came to selection and guidance, it was done separately. The black schools did their own thing and the white schools did their, their thing. How did it happen that you chose psychology as a profession? Psychology intrigued me in as much as it had dealt with a totally human being. However, from a measurement angle, there were all sorts of shortcomings in the sense that the earliest work sort of maintained that it was essentially cognitive abilities which were predictive of future success. And far too little attention was paid to personality measures and all the other related measures that were of a non-cognitive kind. Uh, I must just jump the gap here, and that is that I spent about two years at the old Human Resources uh, Institute, and then I went to the National Institute for Personnel Research. And Dr. Simon Bishival was then the head of that particular section. And he was world-renowned. Everybody who heard his name and everybody who subsequently heard of the NIPR, in fact, rated it as one of the top institutes in the world. Now, as far as comparative work was concerned, I think South Africa was ahead of Europe, far ahead of Europe, and also ahead of, of, of England, Great Britain. The, the place that was ahead of us, and particularly as far as measurement was concerned, was the United States of America. Bishevel had the vision, and he, he, he knew exactly what had to be done. And at no stage you know, had he a bias either against or for whites or for blacks. He wanted to see what should be done to really lead both groups to the best advantage. Uh, very early, one of his major contributions was the, you could say, almost practical tests, which he had designed for use in the gold mining industry. The African workers were grouped into different levels, up to a supervisory level, and for the rest, you know, ground workers underground. And those, uh, that bat a particular battery of his was used for the best part of 20 years or more. It was supplemented by other tests being brought in again, minor revisions here and there, but it was never abandoned. It was a very useful test. 
on the on a higher level, uh, we made use of of a series of of cognitive tests, which were specially designed by the NIPR. Uh, at a higher level, around about matric level, was the mental alertness level. Then there was an intermediate level, which was lower, round about standard eight. There were the spiral nines, round about standard six level. So we could, in fact, cover the ground at a fairly low level by means of these tests. Uh, well standardized tests and norms specifically designed for whites at that stage and separate norms for blacks. In the work for the Air Force, Bishevel made use of a sort of a, how would I best characterize it? You would do a, a, a psychometric test, and while you're busy with the psychometric test, the supervisor administering the test had to make, had to make certain personality assessments. And the assessments that were made there were essentially in terms of, it was later, later uh, you know, characterized as such, not initially. Uh, introversion, extroversion was assessed. General neuroticism was assessed. Uh, the activity level of the person was assessed. And a, a, a broad personality description of these people were made. And these uh, personality descriptions proved to be invaluable for the Air Force. Uh, at a later stage, uh, I elaborated on some of those things by constructing a tilting room, tilting chair, and a rod and frame test and so forth for assessing essentially field dependence, field independence. And the, the, the success that we had in the Air Force in selecting the, the Harvard crew, because the, they were flying Harvard, Harvards at the time, was phenomenal. We hardly ever had a crash, and only a small number of, of uh, pilots were washed out. And they were washed out at the early stages they had to be able to fly solo by 32 hours. And if they didn't make it, they were washed out. And there were also a series of ground subjects, like aerodynamics and navigation and so on and so forth, where they had to write exams, and if they didn't pass that, they were washed out. But if they, in fact, managed to, 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 to pass the ground subjects, and they could fly within 32 hours, then... Uh, it was go. You were actually put into a tilting room which is housed within another room. And while you are sitting in the tilting room, uh, you were blindfolded and the tilting room was then tilted, but you, you wouldn't know how much it was tilted. And of course the room around you stayed put. And then when the blindfolds were removed, you were given control over the chair that you were sitting in and your assignment was to adjust your test to the true vertical. Now, I saw many, many so-called pupil pilots sitting at an angle of 35 degrees, saying that they are quite upright now. Now, this, this orientation in terms of, of uh, your, your kinesthetic uh, interpretation was important in flying, particularly in inform information flying and so forth. We also had some of these subjects, you know, exposed to very low pressures, and very high pressures to see how they uh, fared in those situations. They were also put into a, a sort of a turntable which spun them around to make sure that their ears were okay and so forth. The, the uh, electrophysiological measures took about four days and our test battery took also several days. And then on the basis of all of that, we came up with our assessment of the pupil pilots. The tilting chair was devised by yourself. The very initial tilting room tilting chair was designed by Whitkin in uh, New York. And uh, I read his work and I designed this one, which departed in many ways from his. And uh, it was constructed by the workshop of the CSIR. And I visited Whitkin in 1967, and he asked me to give a lecture or two and so on and so forth, which I did, and I showed the apparatus and so on. And they were dead quiet. Not a single question was asked afterwards. 
So I wondered now, why was this? And then when I saw him privately, I asked him, and he said, no, they were all worried, lest I ask to see their apparatus. <laughs> their apparatus was primitive compared with ours. Ours was fully electronic. And uh, you could make adjustments of a half a degree at a time. We had a full-time person there with the name of Dan DeVette. And he designed, uh, let's say, apparatus this for just about every function that you could dream up on a sensory motor level. Beautiful, beautiful apparatus. And it's all fully described in, in our journal, uh, Octa Psychologica. And... Uh, Dan's tests at that time were electrical, mechanical. Yeah. And then, of course, subsequently, electronics came into the picture and things changed quite a bit. Yeah. But these apparatus were essentially used for setting up uh, a situation where the person could do the psychomotor test and then be rated in yeah. terms of how he worked. Yeah. Uh, what, what sort of emotional stability did he show and so on. So. Bisio's approach there was essentially an observational one. You had to observe the person while he was actually working and then assess him in terms of, of this temperament schedule. Yeah. It was novel and unique, and the rest of the world took note of what we were doing. Yeah. Please tell us more about your years at Princeton. Uh, I spent three years in the States at, at Princeton at the time. Uh, I had the union bursary and the Caesar I paid my salary. And there I specialized essentially in psychometrics. And the psychometrics helped me to come up with much more modern ways of constructing and analyzing test scores. Yeah. I had the, the good fortune there of working under a person like Ledger Tucker, uh, who was an expert on fact analysis, and Harold Gullickson, who wrote this book, Mental Test Theory. And uh, at ETS, there was Fred Lord again. Now, those people were n numbers one and two in the field of psychometrics. And it was, in fact, a great privilege to study under them. And uh, that helped me when I came back to South Africa to be on the forefront as far as the statistical techniques of test development is concerned. You know, whenever you design a new test, first of all, you have to have a proper conception as to what the construct is that you want to measure. That construct then has to be mapped out in the sense of what is the domain spanned by that particular construct. What are the subdomains? And then within each of those subdomains, you have to write 20 to 30 items of behavior, which is going to form the basis of your psychometric test. Now, if it was, if you, if you fared well at that stage, if the content was there, you could guarantee the rest. The test would be reliable and it would have predictive power. If, however, your content validity was poor, then everything tended to collapse. As a good example, Hans Eising's measure of neuroticism, for instance, he measured about four or five items of behavior. And for the rest, essentially permutations of words. The same construct, same idea, just asking different words. The net result was the internal consistency of his scale was high in the sense that there was, uh, you know, internal uh, consensus, but the, the validity of the thing was much lower than what it, what it could have been. Now, we, we always, you know, stress the fact that the test had to be uh, content valid first. And then at least 20 to 30 items per construct. Yeah. Then you could guarantee reliabilities of comma eight to comma nine, which is what, what we were looking for. What do you feel most proud of? Well, there's one test which, which I'm quite proud of even today, uh, called concept attainment. I designed that particular test I've got an example of it, if you want to take a, a picture of some of the parts of it. I uh, designed that in 1959, and I applied it very extensively at uh, Cooper Union, which was an engineering school in New York. 
And together with this particular device, which was in three forms, a verbal form, a numerical form, and a spatial form, I applied those three, three tests together with a broad battery of reference tests. And the reference tests were, again, of a verbal, spatial, numerical nature, and then tests of induction, deduction, etc., and also tests of mathematics, uh, intermediate algebra, coordinate geometry, trigonometry. All of those were applied to the school at, at um, Cooper Union. And then I did a fact analysis to see now, does the, does the test of, of concept attain just spread its variance across all these other measures, or does it come up with a measure of its own? And uh, it's also published. Uh, it came out beautifully, measuring a construct on its own. And to this day, I think it can be used very profitably in a context where high-level reasoning is required. It was used in South Africa for several years as one of the measures for selecting uh, airline pilots as well. Uh, one of the most important constructs, which is so easily overlooked in everyday life, is uh, locus of control. Locus of control can be broken down into at least two components, bipolar opposites, an internal locus of control and an external locus of control. And then internal locus of control is normally also strongly associated with autonomy. A person who is high on internal locus of control can function autonomously, can tackle a new problem on his own, can develop himself and make sure that he comes up with the best possible solutions for new problems. If he fails, he'll immediately accept that the shortcoming was with him and then he'll do his best to update that and come up with the best. By contrast, the person with an external locus of control, they will say the external locus of control, circumstances beyond my control. The whole environment was against me. My boss had his knife in for me. I wasn't promoted because of some mal malicious doing on the part of the boss. Uh, lady Luck wasn't with me. Uh, all, all these sort of rationalizations to blame your shortcomings on the external world rather than to accept the shortcoming, work on it and develop yourself to the highest possible level. Now even today, if it comes to appointment of staff, I would think twice before I appoint a person who is very high on external locus of control. He must be high enough on internal control to accept responsibility for what he's doing and to be able to function autonomously. And I find that this construct of autonomy correlates with numerous other personality measures. Ability to concentrate. Uh, we did a, a study jointly with the 16PF and also with other measures of psychological well-being. And every time you find that if you see the person who's high on, let's call it, psychological well-being, he's also high in terms of, of an internal locus of control. So I think for today, the internal locus of control is a terribly important thing. Uh, I've designed a test on concentration ability. There you find essentially a three-factor structure. Ability to concentrate and to concentrate for long periods of time. Distractibility and also a sort of a general arousal sort of a factor which comes into the picture. Now, a person who's high on concentration ability and low on distractibility is one of your best achievers in, in, in real life. So, uh, locus, uh, uh, attention is, is, is a terribly important thing. More recently, I constructed a scale, to, uh, a generic scale, for measuring work performance. Prior, prior to 1990, there were no good theories of, of um, work performance. 
everybody was just assessed with a view to pinning his salary or whatever by a supervisor who made the ratings of this particular person. The scale that I designed measures at least three facets. The volume and quality of work that the person does, some, some ten items dealing with those issues, and then let's call it creativity and initiative. What sort of initiative does he take in the work situation? How creative is he finding new solutions for old problems and that sort of thing? And the third one was managerial style. Uh, this particular scale with these three facets, in, in fact, I think, gives you a much better picture as to how the person's functioning in the work situation. A lot of work has been done prior to my work, but I thought I would, oh, I'm going to do a, a study which is metrically the soundest you could get. First of all, the issue of restriction of range always plays a role in lowering the validities that you find, particularly if the range is highly restricted. Now, in this particular case, I worked with students and I looked at the spread of their IQs and I think the lowest cutoff point I took was at 95. And then I, from, from a strictly theoretical point of view, I counted exactly how many persons should fall in each IQ group from 95 up to 135 plus. So the, the, the distribution was an exact distribution and I could say my point of truncation was at 95 and if I now make the correction for restriction of range then I could do it properly. The battery of tests that I used was the evoked potentials of the brain, in particular the cortical con conductivity speeds of neurons in the brain, special apparatus for this, and uh, I took visual and auditory measures looking at the wavelengths and so forth. And at the same time, the same group did four tests of intelligence, the, uh, the, the um, what is it, the general selection the classification test battery, the, the Raven's advanced form, Gottschalk figures, and mental alertness. Those were the four tests that were administered on the, on the psychometric level. Uh, the psychometric tests were fact analyzed, yielding two factors, a verbal and a nonverbal one. And those scores were then systematically related to all the different measures on the evoked potential side. Multiple correlations of 0,6, 0,65 were obtained between the evoked potentials of the brain and the measures of, of intelligence. So you could in, in fact say that the brain measures fluid intelligence, which is quite strongly related to the crystallized abilities that you, you measure using tests of intelligence. And I think that's a very important issue. The fact that it's uncontaminated by any bias that you could come up with. It's an apparatus, it's, it's the cortical conduction speeds of neurons, and uh, these, these things relate very strongly to your attained intelligence. However, if the person didn't have the opportunity to go to school, develop his skills to the fullest, then the correlation is not going to be terribly high. But finding uh, measures of fluid intelligence correlating comma six far is in fact very promising. Uh, while I was doing this work, uh, I had a visit from an old Nobel Prize winner with the name of William Shockley. He designed the Shockley uh, diode. And uh, he was very unhappy with the measures that he had seen in the States where pencil and paper tests were, were used looking at racial differences there. So he wanted to come and see especially what, what I was doing here. He and his wife visited me for about four hours. He looked at the apparatus and, you know, the scoring of it and the findings and so on. And then he said, and this is quite significant, uh, he says, I want to tell you something which people don't always appreciate. He says, I never read a journal article from beginning to end. 
I will look at the statement of the problem. Is it a good problem? I'll then look at the design. Are there any holes in the design or whatever? He says, and I will then only look at the tables and graphs and I will avoid at all costs reading the discussion of the author. Now, he had to break away from tubes in order to come up with diodes and, and transistors. Now, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have had a cell phone this size now. It would have been a huge thing with tubes. And uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit. Everything on the electronic side that has shrunk to this size is due to William Shockley. So he was interested in your... He was interested in the evoked potentials of the brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if he did any f further work on it. He was already, you know, quite aged. He died about two years after that. Are there any patterns in how psychology has evolved over all of the years? Can you identify any specific trends and patterns? When it comes to the total personality, I would always say start off with values. Values is so central. Uh, if a person doesn't have the integrity to in fact do what he promises to do and to do it to the best of his ability, then you're lost with that particular person. So values is number one. Following that, the total personality, the interpersonal relationships of that person. Where is he going to best be able to express his personality? If he's an extreme extrovert, you can't put him between four walls and keep him there for, for eight hours a day. He needs to be interacting with people all the way. And then the emotional stability of the particular person, his locus of control, uh, the basic interests that he has. Uh, it is such a wide domain, and uh, I, I don't think we can ever really exhaust all of it. But in the selection context, at least you want to look at the cognitive, you want to look at the interest pattern, you want to look at the value system of the person, and then get a good basic description of the person. Does he have an internal or external locus of control? Can he concentrate properly? Is he free from pathology? Uh, I think one of the most debilitating, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's call it a disease, actually, uh, on the on the psychometrics on the psych psychological side, would be something like a bipolar depression. Uh, the 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 dopamine levels in the brain can be measured and if you prescribe the necessary drugs to, to keep that at the right level, the person can function on a day-to-day -day basis as normally as you can get, uh, but he must keep, keep, keep up you know, with these with these dopamine uh, therapies and things and so forth. So also the work situation itself. How do you set about assessing work? Uh, I mentioned very quickly the generic scale that we've constructed for measuring work performance. I think also there, from a training angle, from an assessment angle, from a promotional angle, you want to know exactly how the person is faring in the particular work situation. Uh, the nature of work itself. Uh, also, a lot of these tests uh, that are currently on the market, in fact, have some items in them for measuring, uh, what would you call it, social desirability. But then, more often than not, just something like six to ten items. The result is you can't get a reliable measure of social desirability, and it contaminates the scores that you are coming up with. So I would much rather plead also for a, a, the best possible test from a psychometric angle and then apply jointly with that test a test a, a scale such as the Marlow Crown for measuring social desirability. I think then you'd be best able to, to separate these things because social desirability itself is also multidimensional. 
and then the format of, of items. I think I must say something about that. Since 1932, uh, with Likert's format, uh, you'd have a statement which is either positively or negatively directed, and then an agree-disagree format, which is normally on a five-point five scale. Now, <coughs> that sounds all good and well, but if you see what happens in practice, there's a study, for instance, by Bernard Bass many years back, where he applied, uh, we, we, what he did first of all was he used the old F scale, and then he got a, a colleague of his to, to write the inverse of the F scale. He correlated these two. Now, if the one's the inverse of the other, you ought to get a high negative correlation. He, in fact, got a positive correlation of about comma four seven, which says that the fact that these items are all positively or negatively directed, the, the fact that they are directed statements, that causes a positive association between the items, which is in fact false. So to illustrate it in the concrete, if I would say, I have a wonderful boss, he gives me all the opportunity to learn and grow in the work situation, that sounds very good, and I agree with it. But later on, I, I come up with another statement. Uh, I hardly ever get any opportunity to, to learn and grow in the work situation. Then the person agrees again because of the directedness of the statement. Now, I've broken away completely from these statement things. And uh, my, my preference is to ask a question. To what extent do you get the opportunity to learn and grow in the work situation? And I use a strictly seven-point interval scale, not a, an ordinal scale such as agree-disagree kind of thing. Uh, if, you, if, you will, if you will use just three sort of lead-ins to your responses, the one could be to what extent. To what extent does the boss take you, you know, in his confidence in sharing uh, principles with you? Not at all, to a great extent. Frequency. How often does it happen that the boss doesn't inform you about important decisions that were taken? How often? Hardly ever or never, all the way through to very often. And then uh, a lead in such as how. How justified are you in the retrenching staff if economic matters don't, don't flow so well? Now, I feel that asking a question, bringing in these uh, variations that I've referred to, uh, puts the respondent in a better position to come up and, and express his views about these particular issues. So we've got to scan the total field, look at all the constructs that we want to measure, make sure that the content is there, make sure that the item format is there, and then a proper statistical analysis. And then from a construct validity angle, look at the structure. And from a discriminant validity angle, relate your particular measure to all the other measures that you've got. And from a validity angle, a predictive angle, uh, concurrent as well as predictive, correlate your, your test with work performance. But work performance properly assessed using a scale such as the one that we've designed. Looking back at your experience in psychology or the field of psychology, what stands out for you? Are there certain things that you regard as, as high points in your career? Or are there certain things that you'd like to regard as dangers in the field of psychology for us as professionals? I've written a fairly extensive article on the psychometric assessment of brain damage. Uh, it's due to be published any day now in a, as, as a chapter in a book in the United States. And I think also there, there's such a mass of useful information which is available and uh, which can help to assess uh, brain damage. But as far as our general approach is concerned, I think we must look at psychology in a much wider sense than in the past. 
where we started off by looking essentially at perceptual and cognitive uh, abilities, we should now expand and actually look at the total personality as best as we can. What still needs to be done? If you had another hundred years, what would you still really like to achieve in the extra hundred years? I would probably continue in the psychometric fields, but looking at things more multidimensionally, trying to uh, associate a lot of different measures to see what's basically at the heart of it. And then, of course, there are a lot of tests that I'd like to scrap, which are used in practice, not, not classified tests, you know, as far as the, the, the professional board is concerned, but uh, people swear by these uh, things and they, they do more damage with them than, than the right. And then, of course, the training of the persons who, who are going to interpret these scores. There are a lot of good tests, but there are also abuses taking place with tests that are inappropriate. So I would, I would probably go for better tests. And then I'd also look at situations in the training context. What are the issues? What are the critical things that lead to good judgments within a particular context? Now there you've done a, a marvellous piece of work and uh, I think a, a great deal more work should be done there. If you had to mentor or talk to a young psychologist, what would you say to them? I would hold up the profession for them and show them that it's a wonderful profession, dealing with people, etc., etc. But from a training angle, I would stress a very important issue, and that is nobody should go out do an internship, get registered, and then be unable to read their own journal. And this, this is something pointing at, at universities as well. We must try, and that's the same for medicine. What's the good of having a good research journal and persons can page through it and not understand what it's about? So I, I would insist that we... we we review the, the content of our uh, syllabi at university and make sure that the, you know, the statistical basis is there at least. And then it depends also on your lecturers. You know, if you, if you think in terms of positive states, uh, many of our lecturers are fairly uninteresting. I would like a lecturer to be creative in the sense that they can take a problem and rephrase it and come up with something brand new and stimulate their students to in fact tackle this new problem and come up with something new. I would like to assess our postgraduate students in terms of creativity, in terms of the positive states that, that, that leak on to appreciative intelligence. I'd like to assess them, but I'd also like to assess the lecturers. If the lecturers are, how can I say, non-creative, if I take now William Shockley, he was creative all the way, to the point where he didn't even want to read the stuff that his, his contemporaries were, were producing because he was searching in a totally different direction. Uh, in the same way, I would love to see our students and our lecturers being able to reframe things and create new issues from an entrepreneurial angle. Uh, I've been working in a particular field entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially and it failed. You look at my solution and you say, oh, but if you turn it around, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can make something wonderful out of it. And I think that sort of creativity is missing in a lot of the work that we do. The result is we use tests, we select, etc., etc., but we do it in a fairly non-creative way. So creativity I would like to see. What characteristics do you believe are core to being a good psychologist? 
you know, if you, if you speak to patients that really have clinical problems, they'll tell you, I've gone to a psychologist so-and-so, I visited him once, and I made an assessment of his personality and his values, and I've come to the conclusion it's a waste of time to go back. In other words, the psychologist is also being assessed by the patient. And I think we must, in fact, do a proper study as to what does patients expect from clinicians. Mm -hmm.